You're listening to the number two review on MovieHouseMemories.com, the world's greatest podcast for the world's worst films. So pull up your big stool. The fun begins now. Welcome back to the number two review on Movie House Memories, where each episode we pluck one of Tinseltown's biggest piles off the fan and see if it smells as bad as the day it was released. I'm Chris. G'day, I'm Shane. And I'm Shane. And you guys survived through watching this film for today. Um, but we have a film that Shane T is just hoping, hoping very dearly that Hollywood will make a sequel to. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, didn't it say at the end, uh, we'll be back. Uh, we can only sure. hope. <laughs> <laughs> and our film today is 1988's E.T. rip off Mac and me. Maybe they'll do the sequel to Mac and me when they can rip off E.T. sequel. Is that how it works? Maybe, but you'd think by now there would have been an E.T. sequel and, this i don't can't even see even at the time when they were making it that they thought it was going to be successful enough to make another one no and today's uh podcast as this film is as well is sponsored by mcdonald's and coca-cola and skittles (laughs) and sears and straws lots and lots of straws and whatever company makes those remote control cars and power tools there was a few of them used in this movie too those are probably those are probably Sears brand, if anything. I don't know what Sears is. I'm assuming that's like a department store. Yeah, and they're known for their power tools. Today's film was directed by Stuart Raffilm and stars Christine Ebersol, Jonathan Ward, Tina Kaspar, and about three people in cheap rubber suits. Or was it four? How many of those little fuckers were there? Total? Well, there was a there was a baby, but. It was a no. little baby. You wouldn't think you'd put a, a toddler in one of those or a newborn in one of those rubber suits. They could sell one more Happy Meal. You'd better believe it. They're going to. <laughs> but before we get too much farther, Shane T has the wonderful task of piecing this sloppy narrative together. Shane, what do you got? Oh, yeah. Here we go. A NASA spacecraft has landed on an unknown planet that looks a hell of a lot like Southern California and collects rock and soil samples. A family of quite graceful aliens discover it and are sucked up through its vacuum, which is their one true weakness, and get taken back to Earth. The aliens are able to escape from a military base, but during the escape, the youngest alien hides in a passing van. Occupied by a wheelchair-bound boy named Eric Cruz, his older brother, Michael, and their single mother, Janet, who are moving to California. Eric soon falls off a cliff into a lake while in his wheelchair, apparently just yards from his suburban California home. The little alien sees his plight and rescues him. Eric tries to tell people, but no one will believe him. Eric sets a trap with the help of Debbie, who is the only other person to have seen the alien. They capture and then release the alien, and Eric's brother Michael now believes Eric, but the alien once again disappears, and Mom just can't be convinced. Eventually, FBI agents Wicket and Zimmerman track down the alien to the crew's residence. They are immediately recognized by the kids. Eric is forced to take the alien, whom he has named Mac, which also probably had a lot to do with the corporate sponsorship of Mac Donald's of this film. The FBI pursues in a well-written and wonderfully uh, filmed hijinks ensue. It is truly a thing of beauty. At one point, the little graceful alien takes the dance, and I'll be damned if it didn't make me tear up. The kids decide to try to reunite Mac with its family. They manage to find them in an abandoned mine. While stopping at a gas station, they accidentally alert security. Of course, there's a shootout, and Eric is caught in the crossfire and dies. Mac and his family then use their powers of good and love of rubbery suits to bring Eric back to life. For saving Eric, Mac and his family are granted citizenship unless Donald Trump becomes president. Then INS might get involved. Also, there's a final scene which assumes there would be a sequel, which is certainly the funniest moment of this film. You know, I'm thinking we should have warned that there are spoilers in your summary in case somebody wanted to see this film who hadn't already. Oh, yeah. And there was something about your summary, Shane T, and I wouldn't normally question it, but you said they were graceful aliens. That's yeah. preposter- That's preposterous. <laughs> I, I know they, it is. I know they it's walk preposterous. Around. I, I, oh, okay. Sarcasm. Yeah. Ah. 
So you're taking the mickey out. I wasn't sure because they walk around like they're constantly drunk. I'm taking the piss. Yes. Mm. I'm, gonna <laughs> I'm a bit slow. Sorry, mate. It's, it's, it's morning here. <laughs> yeah, I thought they were the least. Uh, I don't think, uh, speaking of the grace of the aliens, I don't <laughs> think they could see shit out of those suits. It literally looked like any time you saw them, they were almost being guided by a string. They were generally walking sideways. I mean, they were the most clumsy, awkward things I've almost ever seen on film. And, you know, uh, the Teletubbies look like, you know, gold medal gymnasts compared to these fucking things. These were hairless Teletubbies. <laughs> That's how it is. <laughs> hairless with no genitals. Oh, they didn't have te te um, Teletubbies had none either. That's right. Well, these had mouths that kind of look like anuses, so maybe. Yeah, it was really constantly weird because they were, uh, it was like their little open mouths were the same shape the whole time. First off, let's, let's do get this out of the way. This movie did have a ton of corporate sponsorship. Part of the proceeds of this film, which there were none, would have in theory gone to the Ronald McDonald house. On the back of my DVD, it's like, oh, with a special rare appearance from guest star Ronald McDonald. And I'm like, really? I mean, that's because nobody will put fucking Ronald McDonald in their movie unless you paid them. So it, I, it made it seem like it was a thing. Uh, so this movie was basically an hour and a half long commercial. And on that note, it was released on August 12th, 1988. Um, and like Shane said, it, it lost a lot of money. It it was it had a budget of like thirteen million, but only made six point four million. So it's a double whammy because not only did it suck, but it didn't make any money for Ronald McDonald Charities. This is the first film that I've looked up, although I'm sure it's not uh, the only one that has a zero percent critics rating on Rotten Tomatoes, but it still had critics rate it. Twenty three of them reviewed it, and it still was at zero. Oh, so technically our lowest rated movie we've done, even worse than Cool World, which is kind of our standard. Yeah, so when I said I was bringing us back to form with this mm -hmm. film, I wasn't lying. We picked a real, yeah. I picked a real loser here. Yeah, but it still wasn't the worst of the year for Golden Razzies, though. Do either of you want to take a guess for well, 1988? 88. There was a um, film worse than this. Was w Willow? Was that the year of Willow? No, I think Willow was 86. That could okay. be. Okay. Willow's awesome. Um, worst picture went to Cocktail. Oh, uh, they're uh, fucking wrong about that. <laughs> Mate. I yeah, love co Cocktail. That's one of my Cocktail movies. rocks. I love that movie. Yeah. I, was a bar, I attended bar for, you know, mm -hmm. five, six years. So that's one of those movies where it's sort of like Roadhouse, you know, right? Doorman love Roadhouse. Yeah. Bartender. You know, there's sort of those niche movies that, it, so I don't know. I think he's wrong about yeah. that. So uh, Cocktail and got worst picture and worst screenplay. Uh, I've got to bring it up, the Australian connection in Cocktail. Another reason I like it, Brian Brown. <laughs> but this film did tie for Worst Director, and it did get Worst New Star. Does anybody know who Worst New Star was? All those kids were really bad actors. Well, that were terrible. And you, you can come across some 80s movies that have some decent kid actors that didn't really go anywhere, but these this group were, was shocking. I don't know. I think they who, found him who, at McDonald's. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, the worst new actor was Ronald McDonald. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny you bring him up because obviously he's a lot to do with the movie, but I threw the trailer on him. I've got the DVD too and had the trailer on it and it was Ronald McDonald basically introducing the movie. And I thought, this is a bit weird. And he was plugging the charity in the trailer. So, yeah, it's a shame it probably didn't make much. It probably still sold a few Big Macs, but it wouldn't have made the money for charity that they would have hoped at the time. It's but funny, I was looking at some of the things that were written back at the time, and sort of the main character kid, uh, Jade Calgary, uh, you know, he actually is in that wheelchair. And, is uh, he? Yes, he is actually, uh, has, I think, I believe, spina bifida. I'm not sure. He has something that like, he's in that chair full time. He is an actor. He's been in a couple other things, not a lot, obviously. Um, and uh, a big thing at the time was people to criticize this movie because they were like, oh, you're using the wheelchair like a prop and uh, this, that, the other. And I was like, I don't really think they, I mean, I'm not, this movie sucked, all right? But 
I don't know. I feel like defending it a little bit there. I'm like, I don't really think so. The lead actor really was in that uh, chair. He did some of his own little stunts in the film, even or whatever. And did I he really know. go off the cliff? Was that him, or did they use a double? <laughs> <laughs> no, but he did. But he was in the water with his chair and did the, that whole part himself once the actual fall was done. Mm. And yeah. that fall, of course, is the silly scene that made me pick this um, because Paul Rudd. Uh, I mean, I don't know. You probably I don't they, I don't know if they have this down under, but there's a, a late night show sort of here called Conan O'Brien. And uh, every single time Paul Rudd has come on with one of uh, to basically promote any movie whatsoever. They say, let's look at the clip. And, the you know, the very first time, I think, was like 12 years ago. So it was a while ago. And they play that clip, the whole little scene where they goes down, he falls in the water, and the little alien pops up, and his eyes get big, and then it ends. And so now it's a running gag because Paul Rudd's done it for every single movie he's ever done since on that show. So it's yeah. the only way I know this movie, and that's why I picked it. So, you know, uh, fuck you, Paul Rudd. <laughs> I haven't seen him do that, but I, I do know of Conan O'Brien and seen his show plenty of times. But it, it it's probably got, I don't know why, and we'll talk about it, I guess, at the end. I don't know why it's got a cult following in some respects, because it's irritating when you watch it. It's not, not really an enjoyable film, and I'm looking through kids' eyes as well. I'm not sure that I would enjoy it. Well, there's the storyline makes no sense in any regard. I mean... I can't even suspend belief it's so so bad that these aliens, first of all, get sucked up into uh, the machine, and then uh, they easily escape. But we don't know that the family escapes, but somehow they have, and they're all separate. And one of the, the glaring things is, why did this family move co- cross-country from, what was it, Illinois or whatever, to California just so mom could get some retail job that she could have got in her town? I mean... That made no sense to me. Chris, 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 you're wrong. This is the 80s. So (laughs) basically women got divorced. And when they did that in movies, they went across the country to some other state and started life over with the kids. I mean, come on, man. Karate kid. I can go on and there's going to be quite a few. That's true. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just saying the Lost Boys did it. As yeah. well, but yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't even explained in a in a way. You had to guess that, Shane, because I know. They, Without... at one only once did they look at a photo, and you had to presume it was their father. They never mentioned it. I don't think they didn't. I just guessed because it was such a trope of the time, you know. Uh, yeah. But the other thing, I don't know how this. Could, okay, just from a technical perspective, and I'm not talking about the actual filming of this movie. I'm talking about watching it. I, I went and got it on DVD in my video store, and of course it's not <laughs> widescreen; it's full screen or whatever. You know that's okay, whatever. That's how it was filmed, but it's so old and it's never been updated because nobody gives a damn. It used <laughs> it used what they you know before HD TVs when TVs were broadcasted they actually showed every other line. It's called interface or interlacing technology i believe your eyes filled in the blanks that's how old tvs work they showed you every other line and you filled in the blanks and that's how i mean it moved still so it's every other line moving and every you know however many seconds or whatever and you couldn't tell but now on my hd tv because it's such high definition and because the frame rate is so much higher there were these little squiggly lines all through the picture on a DVD the entire time. It was so annoying. It almost gave me a headache. So it was practically unwatchable. Yeah. I that was the reason it was practically unwatchable. <laughs> you know, that's a, well, that's the thing is that that makes it so oh God, I'm just saying you said it was a grind. Yeah. Imagine this going on on top of it. You're just like, it just made me want to hate it so much, which yeah. of course I did. I did notice what you're saying, Shane, and some of it was even a little bit pixelated because they'd expanded it almost in some of those action scenes and explosions. But there, that very first opening shot, I've got to admit here that I think Saturn was in the background, courtesy of the art department. That looked okay. 
I know it was a, a wide shot and it was all uh, paint, uh, painted, obviously, but it, it looked pretty good and it looked better than anything that was in, say, Flight of the Navigator, which was a couple of years earlier than this. I don't know. Yeah, but, but then you go directly to that sort of lander thing and it's literally PVC pipe with parts wrapped in like a bronze looking aluminum foil. Yeah, I know. So <laughs> bad. And the suit certainly, I think, should definitely be in the conversation for the worst special effects creature ever on screen. Yeah. They're so, they're so bad. And not likable in any way. Not cute, not lovable. No personality. Not, no, nothing. Creepy. And then worse, I mean, to show how much corporate branding there was in here, Coke, not only do they love Coke-branded products, and Sprite, you know, that's one of the Coke-branded products also. They make sure to show you that. Uh, it literally heals them. Like, if they're injured, they can drink soda, and soda's so good for them that they get better. And that's just, you know, pretty uh, awesome. Yeah, well, well, Mac had, like, a cold or flu-type symptoms, and the little girl said, oh, well, he doesn't look so good, and then offers him a Coke. And it was like, now, if you drink too much Coke, that's not going to fix you up, but that's the way this movie was. Coke to them, or soft drink in general, was like crack. You saw them at the end at the, that shopping center. All they wanted was a case of Coke. Walked out, they were fine. <laughs> they were just, they weren't aliens. They never traveled anywhere. It was actually a time machine. They were just future Americans. Well, we'll get to the whole immigration thing, that courtroom scene at the end. What's going on there? But I don't want to jump. I don't want to jump ahead. No, you go for it. Yeah, movie, there's no reason to wait. You don't have to do it in any order, Shane. Oh, that, well, I vaguely remember seeing this years and years and years ago, probably on VHS, and glimpses of it was coming back to me when I was watch it, watching it. But I totally forgot that swearing in courtroom scene where they're all dressed in suits and even the mother's wearing a dress and a hat and earrings and uh, with a handbag. I can't believe this jumped the shark halfway through, but... <laughs> by this stage and then they drive off in a pink Cadillac and it says we'll be back I mean are we got to tell you I just can't understand what people were thinking with this movie I was I was just thinking what are we doing this is the worst movie we've ever done on number two and I didn't see cool I, I've seen cool world but I didn't do it with you guys so I, I have to say this is the worst I think I would rather watch this than Cool World, but I don't know. That's a that's a hell of a proposition. There is one <laughs> claim to fame this movie has. It was Jennifer Aniston's first feature film. Oh, uh, where was she? Was she in the Maccas when they were dancing? Yes, yeah, she's one of the dancers. Wow. Well, there was a lot of dancing in that scene, and it was... I mean, if you look at it, it looks a bit like girls just want to have fun or, or one of those dance movies of the mid-'80s, but it, it was pretty major, that scene, and done well. But whose birthday party was it? I had no idea, and then all of a sudden they left. So what, all the guests, they just stayed on and kept ate hamburgers while the birthday girl was not there. None of it made sense. No, none of it did. It no. was the worst thing I... have Yeah, it's bad. I mean, any film where the mom accuses her crippled son of putting plants stapled to the ceiling, <laughs> it, it defies all logic. Mom, do you really think he did that? No. Um, it took me a bit to even figure out what the hell was going on then. When he was he rolled out and then noticed all the nature and everything in the kitchen, I, I, that was, yeah, all a bit bizarre as well. Was there a meaning to that, boys? I, I didn't get it if there was. No fucking clue. <laughs> and Shane, where was Jennifer Aniston? Did you actually spot her or did you read that? Nope, I read it. Okay. I doubt you see her for long. <laughs> Thing is, it looks like I'm sort of looking at it. I'm like, why did they make this? You know, I sort of felt like 80s movies were sort of looking towards the 90s at this point almost in 88. You know, that kids movies maybe were, I don't know. I was just wondering what the hell kids movies were. 
then. And in 87, there does not look to be too much that was uh, decent. There was a lot of bad Garbage Pail Kids movies, Kids Incorporated. Uh, 88, you know, had Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Big, The Land Before Time. And then you get to, you know, Mac and Me. Oliver and Company, Short Circuit 2, Big Top Pee Wee, Ernest what, Saves Christmas. What year was Short Circuit 1? Do you guys know? Was that 85? That sounds right. but I, I don't know. Because this film to me actually felt more like Short Circuit than E.T. Or maybe they yeah, just ripped that, off everything in that genre. It had that vibe. I mean, it definitely was... It had missed the boat because it was a friendly alien ET ripoff for sure. But ET was eighty two, I think, and then this coming six, seven years later, uh, just totally lost the vibe from that. What about the scene with the wheelchair screaming down the the hill away from you know the authorities, and then the whole music was built up. Then I almost expected that bloody wheelchair to fly up in the air like the bikes do in ET. That would have been awesome. I was expecting something like that, but it that didn't happen. Oh, oh well. The one thing I did like though was the dogs chasing the alien in the in the little remote control car, and the alien getting stuck in the tree. That was completely cheesy, but I was actually amused by the dogs chasing it. Well, yeah, exactly. I thought that that scene with the dogs chasing Mac in that car it could have led to something possibly funny, remotely funny even. Because when if the mum, because the mum was jogging then with her son in the wheelchair, and they could have something could have happened then and made it a little bit more interesting or funny. But no, they just passed directly behind them. Nothing happened. Did you guys like the mom? What was her name? Chris? Is her name Christine um, Ebersol? Is that who played the mom? Yeah, it is. Because I've looking. seen her in other films too. Yeah, she's definitely good looking. Yeah, she's been in some things. They. Tried to give to get a more well known female lead, but they weren't able to. You know, but Too yeah, smart. she did what Amadeus. That's what I Wolf remember her. Wall, the Wolf of Wall Street, uh, Royal Pains, that TV show. She's been on that the whole time. That's where I I know her from. That, so yeah, she's definitely been in some stuff. That's uh, interesting. Yeah, I I vaguely remember her from Amadeus too. Forgot she was in that. She's really attractive and had potential but i don't know I, i'm not surprised certain other actresses would have turned it down oh yeah no it's not surprising at all the, the, that director even though his name wasn't familiar to me he uh, directed the ice pirates when i checked him out and which is actually one of my favorite you know early childhood movies that was pretty yeah. good if you've ever, have you ever seen, seen that, that as adult uh not recently no why chris am i going to be disappointed no i have the same feeling i remember liking it as a kid but i i have a feeling that yeah. as an adult it might not be that good anymore he also wrote half of this i mean there is definitely a case to you know hang him he made the mannequin sequel oh god mannequin on the move did he yes he did <laughs> okay i think what we're saying is uh he should not be writing <laughs> yeah, the Ice Pirates is like the only movie he ever did that, uh, in my humble opinion, noteworthy. Huh. It could be worth revisiting, like Chris says, it might have changed growing up because it has been a while. But I really do remember seeing that multiple times growing up as a kid and loving the Ice Pirates. So this wasn't a step up at all for yeah. Mac and me. <laughs> Ice Pirates was 1984. Which is the okay. best year for films ever. It is. Yeah, that's arguable, arguably correct. People in our generation, for sure. Yeah, yeah. It's all from where you're standing, though. Uh, when they got to that scene where they were at the air turbines at the end, that reminded me of Seven, the movie Seven with Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman and Kevin Spacey, even the way it was filmed from above the air turbines and obviously they had that high shot circling around with the van that they were in. Did you remember that at all? Was there the anything in a box in this one? <laughs> yeah, that's what I was waiting for, but yeah, no similarities there other than the, mm. the whole scene, the shot. 
Now, let me ask you about that scene where, where they found the family. When I saw them, I mean, the, 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 the costumes, of, as Shane's already said, sucked. But when they were in that cave, I didn't think that was his family. I thought it was just like some other aliens that were there. And I thought there was more of them. Like to me, I thought there's like three or four adults in there. And it was it was just done very poorly all the way around. You can say that. Well, now. that at that point it had slowed right down that movie. Uh, it became boring almost. And when they were like in, in, it took them ages to get into that cave and walk in and find them. And they were laying down sick. And it was, yeah, it was not good. I didn't think the same way as you, Chris. I thought it was definitely them, but it was a scene that could have been snipped at least five minutes. It just went on and on. And how did they get cross country so easily to get to the desert? Cause they still swear they landed in like Indiana or somewhere out in the Midwest or East coast. And they're I'm, all of a sudden in California. I thought it was like Vegas or something. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It looked a bit like Vegas. I mean, cause does anything matter? No. <laughs> I mean, God, it doesn't even, that's the thing is, well, well, I don't know how this movie made it past any stage. It made it past. I'm almost wondering if somebody tried to get a studio to do it and, they were so uninterested. That's why they got all the corporate sponsors and it became what it became. I just wonder what the story is behind it because there's no way this just gets released normally. I mean, even the federal police or whoever they were couldn't catch a fly. And for them not to even detect... I mean, they got out of the facility to begin with and then they couldn't detect where they were. And when Mac went, you know, I, I don't know. And then they just let them become legal citizens. No studying or anything <laughs> after the fact. Well, I, I don't know what immigration laws are like in America, but I don't think they'd pass pass it here. They would, they'd be sent back down under. I mean, there's parts of this movie where, you, as we said, does it all matter? But what about when Mac reads the paper? Like he's reading the paper and reading the news about what's happened. Happened. That, what did, I don't know. I was going to say that jumped the shark for me, but it was probably already jumped by then. Well, on their planet that we saw, they didn't, it was all desert. It didn't look like they even had a civilization with paper that you would even know how to read or anything. And also that vacuum, that that vacuum was reversible. You, uh, that's pretty hard to find 88. <laughs> well, the kid didn't know. I don't think the kid knew that... The, to begin with, the aliens got sucked up in the NASA vacuum and then came out of it. So how did he know how to grab the vacuum and suck up Mac to catch him? I don't know. Good point. And if sucking is these aliens' worst enemy, then aren't they <laughs> their own worst weapon against themselves? But they had no problem with straws. You'd think anything long and narrow that would suck. I don't know. Maybe because they were doing the sucking. I don't know. But they could. They, uh, to me, I don't think they could close their lips to suck on the straw. But they were gurgling the soda. They could never close their mouths quite all the way, huh? I think so. Well, see, there's a future for them, like giving blowjobs down in the, down in the bad parts of town. And then they'll be able to afford McDonald's value menu and everything will be okay. Uh, I was waiting for it. I you have some you soda to ta wash the taste of semen out of my mouth, sir. Uh, I was waiting for you to go down that road, Shane. <laughs> it's just terrible. <laughs> the whole thing's terrible. I hated it so much. And I'm sorry I made everybody watch it. It, it got a little bit interesting well, when I say interesting, I was sort of thinking, what is going to happen here? You know when he had the gun at the end? in the, He was in the shopping centre and they were like, don't move. And I actually thought, because he was waving the gun around, where he might you know, might accidentally shoot someone or hit someone. Or, it didn't happen, though. But that, that mildly caught my attention there towards the end because by that stage I was like, oh, this is just get it over with. And I don't do that very often with movies. That was about after the first five minutes for me. 
For uh, for the story sucking as much as it did, though, did you uh, find yourself looking at your watch, trying hoping it was over, or what did you think about the overall length? No, like any bad movie, I am thrilled if it's basically ninety minutes, and this is it's like ninety three minutes or something if you don't count the credits. That's fine, and you know what? I this might be one of the worst movies we have seen on uh, number two review, but it's certainly not one of the slowest as far as I've seen some that just dragged for me. And yes, the last bit of this movie dragged, but yeah, that, that as that bad dragged. as it was, as bad as it was though, the first, you know, three quarters kept your attention. It's just bad, you know, and some of those movies are bad and don't keep your attention. Uh, for instance, to me, cool world. Once again, that was bad and it didn't keep my attention. I must've checked my watch a hundred <laughs> times during it. Whereas this, I don't recall. I think I checked uh, once or twice to see how much longer was left in the movie. And that was all in the last, you know, third of the movie. So not too bad. Yeah, that it definitely dragged um, after, pretty much after McDonald's, really. Yeah, that got to me, that slow ending. The whole cave scene was, I don't know, you're supposed to feel compassion for these extraterrestrials. I, obviously, that was never going to happen, but it just dragged on too long. There was, there was a weird little scene with the doctor when the uh, the wheelchair-bound boy was in his bed and he was getting checked out and everything, and all the police were there. This is after he'd fallen in the water. The doctor said, oh, now let me give you a sedative. Like, no, he didn't ask his parent mum first. He had not said it even. It was a really weird scene with the doctor, and then he just walked out. But to the kid's uh, benefit, he didn't take it anyway. Oh, <laughs> and okay. Mac using power tools. How does he know how to use those power tools? It was that long drill and that saw, circular saw. Because it was advanced, knowledgeable people. Who don't Which know were left plugged, they were left plugged in overnight, unless he knew how to plug them in too. Oh, he can start things. That's right. He sparks things up. They're smart enough to use power tools, but dumb enough to keep from getting sucked in by one of the machines. <laughs> yeah, they're not even. Uh, as smart, they're not even as smart as a dog. A dog has fucking sense enough to be scared of a vacuum. So, I don't know. Shane, a uh, let me ask you: Do you think this was a cult film, a cult bomb, or a complete bomb? And out of the movies we've seen so far, uh, where would you roughly rate this one? Oh, I can answer that straight away. This is probably the worst one I've uh, reviewed for the number two review to date. And I can see vaguely why some people might think this was a cult movie because it is so bad. But there are better bad movies out there. It was hard to grasp onto anything of quality in this film. I did like that uh Actress who played Janet, as we've already mentioned, Christine Ebersole, attractive, and she had the most talent in the entire cast. But those costumes, they could do better than this. This was 1988. That Back to the Future and that had been done by this. The effects just could have been that so much better, but no one cared. Obviously, it was a foregone conclusion once, I guess, Mac McDonald's got involved and no one in the studios probably didn't want to touch the movie. It's a shame it didn't make any... Uh, money on the charity side of things but you know that's hearsay now it's just a total bomb for me chris yeah i'll agree it's a it's a complete bomb it sucks on every level including its sponsorship which was a big dud i don't think this was <laughs> uh was the worst movie i've seen i still think cool world is the worst and boxing helena i think those two are in front of it but, um, yeah, there will be no reason for me to ever see this again. But, uh, Shane, you're the one who put us through this uh, mess, so you get the final words. Uh, this is a great cult film, and I absolutely love it. I'd urge everybody who's <laughs> listening to please, please go to www.macandme2.com and sign the <laughs> petition to get number two made. We want it made. We need it made. So let's do it. I think they have oh. a thing on McDonald's where you can also vote there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in all reality, uh, yeah, this movie was absolutely terrible. I hated it. Uh, that being said, I also would put it, I would watch it again before the two movies that Chris just mentioned, as well as Cutthroat Island, because I friggin' hated that movie, and that was way too long. So um, it would be above all those for me. So, uh, 
It looks like uh, Shane Adams still has to really dig through some uh, trenches. If this is his <laughs> lowest, I'm actually sort of ashamed that I picked this. But uh, I think we can do better and uh, make him have to watch something that he truly, truly wants to claw his eyes out. Happy feet, Shane. <laughs> Happy two, <laughs> number two. I'm thinking that's my next pick for this. Oh, no, now you're trying to scoop my eyeballs out, aren't you? Yeah, I am. I am. I wouldn't do that to you. But I but might. I, can't, I might. I'm, I'm really surprised uh, that you both think boxing Helena is worse than Mac and me. I, I, that that shocks me. I could easily watch Cheryl and Fenn rolling around in a little box, amputated. Than this again. <laughs> I just can't stand the main character in Boxing Helena. Oh, uh, Julian. That, yeah, Julian Sands acting. is terrible. She has too bad. I mean, are these kids were better actors than Julian Sands. Oh, no, 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 no. These kids were terrible. Honestly. At least I could believe them. that. I could believe them at least. All right. It's time to put this episode shit show to rest, but you don't have to stop listening. You can get more of our senseless rambling over at moviehousememories.com where we have many more podcasts from our sister shows at the Movie House Memories, Lunchtime Movie Review, and Mail Bonding. Until next time at the number two review, I'm Chris. This is Shane A. Bye for now. And this is Shane. Thanks once again for listening. And remember, if you're going to sneak into a movie, make it a good one. This podcast is not endorsed by MGM Home Entertainment and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Mac and Me, all names and sounds of Mac and Me characters and any other Mac and Me related items are registered trademarks and are copyrights of MGM Home Entertainment or their respective trademark and are copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the number two review, the MHM Podcast Network and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted.